I met Casey a few years ago, and for some reason, I not only got his name wrong, <laughs> but I also got wrong uh, what branch of the military he was in. And I did it like more than once, so he was, uh, it was pretty funny because it was kind of an ongoing thing between he and I, and you guys saw the post I made probably yesterday talking about how I'm, lo- I'm thankful that he spared my life, thankful he didn't kill me. But uh, I got his name right now, I know who the fuck he is now, and uh, so does everybody else after watching him successfully deadlift over 600 pounds, compete in powerlifting, kick a lot of ass, and uh, just you know, prove what's capable, what people are capable of when they set their mind to it. And when you make up your mind, when you make up your mind to do something, kind of regardless of the circumstances, regardless whether you're sick or whether your elbow hurts or whether something even worse happened, right? Get the opportunity to kind of make up your mind on what it is you want to do. Super Training Gym was built in about 2005, but kind of officially started as a team in 2006. I'm originally from New York, lived in Los Angeles for a while, met my wife there. My wife is from this area, so that's why I ended up in NorCal. And while I was here, I got more and more addicted to powerlifting and more and more addicted to trying to be as strong as possible. And I I wanted to figure out a way, how can I get as strong as possible in the quickest way possible? And so I turned, obviously, to steroids. No, just kidding. (laughs) (laughs) And that's the end of the seminar. We're selling them (laughs) in the store. Anybody wants a deal on some trend, we got a deal for today. Uh, well, you guys know that part of the story, too, from uh, Bigger, Stronger, Faster. My brother Chris, the director of it, is right there. Give him a round of applause, please. <laughs> and I, I trained at Westside Barbell in Columbus, Ohio, uh, before landing here in, Nor- in NorCal, and at, sometime after uh, living in Los Angeles for a while. And when I came to this area, I trained at a gym in Northern California that was a little bit like Westside Barbell. And I quickly realized, if I'm going to get as strong as possible, as fast as possible, I'm going to need other like-minded people around me in order to pull this off. And so Super Training Gym was 100% designed and created uh, out of just my urge to be stronger. Completely 100% selfish reasons. And uh, only the very few that uh, trained at the original super training gym uh, know what my mindset was back then versus uh, the way I am now. I'd say I'm definitely a lot nicer today than I was then. And uh, Juan Laiha, who's here, uh, he can attest to that, uh, former uh, Marine. And, um, you know, back then it was, it was all about getting stronger all the time. It, it, was, it consumed me. And things have changed a little bit. I have children, I have a business, I have other obligations. So I still want to get as strong as possible. I'm still motivated and moved towards the iron to do the best I possibly can. But there's just other shit going on. (laughs) I got other things going on. And plus, I have pretty much retired from powerlifting after falling with 1,085. But what really made super training, what really allowed me to go towards the numbers that I wanted to get I had a goal to squat over 1,000 pounds. I squatted 1,080. I had a goal to bench press over 800 pounds, and I did 854 pounds. I had a goal to deadlift over 800, and I fell short on one of those goals, and I did 766. I ended up accumulating a 2636 total, and if you add up those biggest numbers, they end up being over 2,700 pounds. I chased after it with everything that I had. I literally did. I, I gave it all that I had, and if I knew a couple more things that I know now, I would have been able to apply it then, but I didn't know some of those things uh, back then. I went from the 242-pound weight class. The entire journey started out in the 181-pound weight class. But as an adult, I went into the 242 weight class, 275, 308, super heavyweight, and then pushing myself to weigh uh, up over 330 pounds. Everything was dedicated to this. I probably took years off of my life to be stronger. And I realize that not everyone has that same goal. Some people just want to be stronger just to feel better. But that's where my mind was at at that moment. That's what I wanted to do. 
That's what I decided to do. That's what I made up my mind to do. Remember, I just mentioned in the very beginning how Casey Mitchell made up his mind that he's not going to use any excuse. He's still going to figure out a way to deadlift over 600 pounds. And when he did it, when he deadlifted over 600 pounds, the greatest power lifter of all time, he'll forever be the greatest power lifter of all time. No one will be able to defeat uh, what Ed Cohn has done. When this guy deadlifted over 600 pounds, Ed Cohn is in just, just, a, just crying like a baby as he was watching him do that lift. And it was really remarkable. We, everybody was crying. Everybody was in tears because of what it represented. Because that represents true strength. And there's different levels of strength. Just because one person squats 900 or deadlifts 900, maybe that's not where you're at. Or maybe that doesn't even vibe with you. Or maybe you just don't even care about that. But to you, the 315 is the world. The, the 225 means, some, means something to you. And it's important that you make up your mind to get after it. You don't have to be the person that everybody else labeled you out to be. You, you don't have to be handicapped. You don't have to be learning disabled. Somebody who can't read, finish school with like a fourth grade reading level. The, the reading level goes down every time I tell the story. So <laughs> it'll, it'll be just like not being able to read at all or something at some point. <laughs> Labeled as, as being dumb, labeled as being stupid. And I have people that come up to me all the time, they're like, dude, you're a genius. <laughs> I, yeah, I don't, I, don't, I don't know what you're talking about. But you get the idea that you don't have to be what you're labeled to be. My education didn't start until I was about 30 years old when I actually recognized that I'm not dumb. I'm like, oh, maybe the people that were telling me that I was dumb, maybe they weren't even that smart to begin with. Maybe I am capable of some of these things. And I started to explore, and I started to learn, and I started to invent, and I started to create, and my mind started to really open up, and I was able to create something like the Slingshot, where Super Training Gym ended up being a great testing ground for that because we had so many people that were hungry to get stronger. Again, Super Training Gym was designed and set up out of selfish reasons originally. But what it has given back to me I can never repay. And that's why the gym is free. People don't understand. They're like, the gym's free? I'm like, yeah, the gym's free. The gym's free. You, you swear, the gym's free. I can just show up there. The gym is free. <laughs> it's free because I can never pay back all the memories I've gotten from this place. I can never pay back all of which I become from this place. You know, I share with people all the time, the more that you do, the more that you can handle. Do more, be more. When we start to be able to lift more, it can do a lot for you as well if you're paying attention. If you're paying attention to what that actually does for you, when you're able to do an extra rep or able to do an extra set, you're able to push through. You're able to push through. Your mind is telling you, hey, you know what? This is, <laughs> this is a really bad idea. Your muscles are shaking. Blood is filling up in the area. You have a lot of pain going on and you just feel like there's no possible way you can do another rep there's no possible way that it's going to happen. And sure enough, you prove yourself wrong over and over and over and over again until you end up becoming something. You end up becoming bigger. You end up becoming stronger. That's kind of the basis of it all. Maybe you get in a little bit better shape. That's kind of the basis of it all. That's kind of where it all starts. But in the end, you end up becoming a different person. You end up becoming a stronger person. And I don't mean about the lift itself. Some of the coolest things in here, in this gym, in the history of this gym, we've had people bench press over 900 pounds. We've had uh, people deadlift over 800 pounds. We've had many 1,000 pound plus squats. We've had a lot of great raw numbers come through. We've had a lot of females uh, rip up some heavy, heavy weights. But one of the cooler things that's ever happened in here has really nothing to do with any of that. And that's kind of the, the brotherhood that's been built through this place. But in addition to that, um, one of our lifters uh, is, uh, is bipolar, and he came to me probably almost, almost 10 years ago. He's been training with us from the very beginning. To me, watching his success and his progress and the fact that he is still alive, he's tried to take his own life many times, to me, that's the greatest success story in Super Training Gym. It's, it's not always about just the weights that we move around. It's not always about that. It's about what you can become from it. So it's something to think about. It's something to consider. Next time that you are thinking about skipping out on a rep or skipping out on a set, start to think about that. Think about 
I think we're all thinking all the time, what's this going to cost me? If I do this extra rep, what's that going to look like for tomorrow? And we should be somewhat concerned with what's going to happen, right? Because we don't want to get hurt. But what can you become? If you really go in there every single time and push yourself to the limit, if you really go in there and push yourself with everything that you have, what are the options? What can you actually become? What can you make up your mind to be if your mind, body, and spirit is stronger than it used to be? Super Training Gym was developed originally for selfish reasons. It's something that has driven me and motivated me to do all the different things that I'm involved in now. But the biggest, the biggest thing about you know, starting the gym off in that way is I had so much support. I had so many great people around me. The record board ends up becoming a big deal. Us battling each other in, in training ends up being a big deal. People talk about the West Side Method, and they talk about you know, what this guy designed and this guy's program. and They talk about all these different programs, but programs don't make champions. Com competition does. Competition is what it's all about. You'll have to figure out a way each and every day to challenge yourself. You'll have to figure out a way each and every day to fight for it. You'll have to figure out a way each and every day to struggle. Without struggle, there's no growth. There has to be struggle. And in order to be successful at anything, there has to be some sort of progress. You can't have progress without having some stuff in there that's going to be difficult. I can sit here and try to make things easy for you and say, oh, you know, we can do this and that with a diet or we can do this and that with nutrition. But you know what? It's going to be hard. It's going to be tough. The training is going to be hard. It's going to be tough. If you want to do a bodybuilding show, it's going to be really hard. If you want to be a power lifter, it can be easy. But if you want to actually be successful at power lifting, you're going to need to be able to make progress. <laughs> the only way to make progress is to work hard. No one gets a free ride. You have to work really hard. And that is why this environment was originally built off of selfish needs. As I started get, getting around more and more like-minded people, our, our group would grow and grow, but the main group would stay the same. There'd be five or six people. Somebody'd say, hey, can I, can I hop in on that bench? Nope. Well, well you know, why not? You know, you're not cut out for it, dude. <laughs> this, is for, this bench is for a bunch of savages, and you don't fit that mold yet. So go over there <laughs> and train in the corner. Are you guys done with, when, when are you guys going to be done with the monolift? Probably in three hours. Probably about three or four hours. They're like, shit, man. <laughs> and they'll mope around the gym and they'll figure it, they'll find their own way. A lot, of the, a lot of the men that would come in thinking that they're strong, they started out in our gym getting their asses kicked by our women. Getting their asses handed to them on a daily basis. I have a saying, and it's a little bit of an interesting saying considering today's guest. If you walk with the lame, you'll develop a limp. This guy's limp is, is, is way different, right? This guy's limp is way different than somebody complaining about some bullshit uh, tendonitis in their knee. This is a guy who legitimately has battle wounds. He's legitimately been through it. But I want you guys to think about it. Think about, think about that for a minute. If you walk with the lame, you'll develop a limp. Another thing that we say in here all the time is either you're in or you're in the way. Who are the people that are in your life right now that are in your way? Could be yourself. <laughs> you're, you're, you might have to kick yourself off the team. That might be the first place you need to start. But a lot of times it's, it's us that's in our own way. So you might need to start there. And that's what I'm talking about by if you walk with the lame, you'll develop a limp. If people are being lame and they're complaining oh man, this gym sucks, man. They won't even let me play my music or they don't let us use chalk or they don't. The gym is inside. The gym, it comes from the inside. It comes from inside your heart. Where does training even start if you think about it? If you really are to think about it, where does training start? It all starts between your ears. It all starts in your brain. You made some sort of conscious decision at some point that you weren't good enough, you weren't big enough, you weren't strong enough, you weren't good looking enough. Uh, you weren't uh, strong enough for the particular sport that you were going to play. It started somewhere, right? It, start, it started with you recognizing, I don't have the look, physique, strength, muscle that I should have, and so I need to figure out a way. I need to figure out a way to make this look different. I need to figure out a way for all this to play out differently than 
it's currently playing out. And so you got your ass in the gym. But as soon as we step in the gym, for some reason our IQ shoots right down to the ground. And people aren't paying attention to what you can get out of training and to what you can get out of putting in hard work. Uh, today I'm going to turn it, or right now I'm going to turn it over to Casey Mitchell. He's a guy that has used weights. He's a guy that, that's used powerlifting to pull him out of some deep, dark shit. Some things that I cannot even, I've had him on the podcast. I've talked to Casey many times. I've talked to him candidly as a friend, just on the cuff. And I, I do not relate in any, in any way to the struggle that this guy has been through. I try to share this all the time with people. People ask me questions all the time. Well, how'd you get this slingshot started? Or how were you able to you know, afford this gym to, you know, to have a free gym? First of all, it all starts with all of you guys. Because while I'm here playing powerlifter, you guys are doing more important shit. You guys are defending our country to allow me to be here playing powerlifter and I get to mess around with these different knee wraps and these different things. I have the freedom to sit around and do that and I thank all of you because without you guys, I would not be able to sit around and do that. But a guy like Casey Mitchell where I can relate is when he talks about the struggle and he talks about how powerlifting has saved and how powerlifting has changed his life. Powerlifting has done the same thing for me, just on a much lesser degree, because I didn't go through that same struggle. Guys, here's Casey Mitchell. Give it up for him. What's up, guys? So we're all in the military, right? So I'm going to give Mark something, and when I give this to him, every single one of you guys will know what it is and what it represents. So Mark, like you said, you know, these guys, every single one of them are heroes. You know, they, they, you guys serve a very small percent. We have served a very small percent of what people are willing to do. There's not a lot of us that will go sign that line. Trust me, I get it all the time. I was gonna, well, you were, <laughs> we fucking did. So I'm, uh, the day that I was, I got, the night that I got blown up, I was laying in Kandahar uh, hospital bed. And uh, Sar Sergeant Major of the Army Preston came up to me, shook my hand and told me that today I was a hero for the country. And uh, I have that same coin right here from Sergeant Major of the Army Preston. And I just want you to give it to you and tell you that you're my hero and you're a hero to these people and you're a hero to the power of the community. So I just want to say thank oh you. Oh my God. <laughs> thank you so much. Appreciate it. Thank you. Appreciate it. That's amazing. So challenge coin from the Sergeant Major of the Army, 13th Sergeant Major of the Army Preston from my personal collection. No words. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, man. Oh, all right. So yeah, so I've known Mark for uh, pretty much since I decided like I was gonna try to attempt to power lift, you know? And uh, from the moment that he caught wind of me like trying to do this, you know, through social media, me going down to the expo, just like everybody else goes to the expo, stands in the line to meet people. You know, he's been a very big, person in my life for me to continue to keep doing this and a motivator for me, a mentor, you know, like a father figure in powerlifting. You know, Ed Cohen came later down the road, you know, there's just a certain ones that have just been in my life and Mark, you've been one of those for me and I can't say thank you enough. Um, so like Mark said, you know, what, what I want to touch on is a little bit of something that I've been kind of talking about a lot lately. I did a, I did a podcast with Mark's brother, Chris, just not too long ago, um, you know, and yeah, you know, I, I feel like I get to speak on this. I've been through it, you know, and the one thing that I know that we all will, for some reason, get labeled as is having this PTSD crap. Okay. PTSD is a label, like Mark said a second ago. That was a label from the get go that I hated, couldn't stand it because of the way that it's been like mirrored onto us. You got these psychologists, these doctors, these people that really haven't been through shit telling me that I have these problems or that I am unstable because what, I fucking kicked ass overseas, fucked some shit up, <laughs> you know what I mean? So now I have problems that I can't, I can get over maybe, but I'm always gonna be labeled to have this. And the thing is, well, I, over time, as I got into like powerlifting and I got into this like lifestyle and this, this new person that I am today, I realized what that was, was growth. 
everything that I had been through from the night that I got blown, man, man, shit, the day that I signed my name on the dotted paper at, at the army recruiting station. That was the very first day of like me turning into a man and growing to the person that I would eventually be today, not knowing what my future was gonna hold for me. And then unfortunately, on my second tour in Afghanistan, I was hit by a massive pressure plate on my very last mission after 13 months of being in that shithole. I got hit and should have killed me. How I lived, none of us know, but I was destroyed, okay? And was sitting there fighting for my life, bleeding out pretty bad. And, you know, you don't think about everything like that as far as like, what's my future got? All you're trying to think about is surviving at the time. And I would try to basically survive for three years. I went through, I can't even tell you how many surgeries. I lived in the hospital legitimately for three years. Lived, so three years of my life, that's where, that's where Casey was. And that's where I was every single day. Hospital bed, surgeries, rehab, everything like that. And during this whole time, you know, I'm still thinking like, oh, I'm gonna stay in the military, which was retarded, it was not happening. It was not happening. So, but during this whole time, it's, uh, there was a lot of growth going on, you know? And as long all these doctors and these psychiatrists and these people that are sitting down and they wanna give me these talks, and I, I'm gonna tell you right now, I'm not saying it's a bad thing, so if you guys need to go see a psychiatrist or a counselor, go see them. But for me, I, I didn't wanna sit down and talk to somebody about some shit that I've been through and that I'm going through physically, mentally, emotionally, and the things that I've been through when they don't, they're just giving me a professional opinion. They don't really understand, okay? You can't really understand like seeing your soldier walking in front of you, getting hit by an idea and just parts going everywhere. You can't understand watching little kids run across a field, stepping on an ID and getting blown to pieces, a little baby, that has, you know what I mean? You can't tell me that you can understand that, you don't, you know? And so during this whole time, I try to figure out like, okay, how do I get past this without sitting there and getting pissed off listening to this professional person tell me like what it is that I have? So I stopped going. That was a personal opinion or a personal decision for me. And I just started working on myself. I really started going to the gym, not powerlifting. I would roll over in a little wheelchair, sometimes an electric one. And I would just work out. And that was my whole way of getting past things. You know, we're all gonna have these little niches or these little things that are gonna help us get past things. But that's what was working for me. Well, then I eventually get told you're retiring, which I didn't think that was gonna happen, but when, let's, I'm not, I wasn't a realist at the time. And so then, when I joined the military, I was like, I'm doing 20 years, this is what I wanna do, there's nothing else that I wanna do but be in the military. So when I went in as a youngster, they're like, what do you wanna do? I was like, I don't know, I just wanna be in the shit. So they're gonna go infantry, I was like, yep. And they're like, do you wanna jump out of planes? I said, yep. But when I retired at 23, 24 years old, beat the shit, literally, what am I supposed to do with a resume? You know what I mean? What am I supposed to do? I'm 23 years old. Am I just, could I write it out and just collect my 100% disability and just be happy with that? Yeah. But my father is 60 something years old and he's been retired for four years and he's went back to work because he's losing his mind. I was 23. What the hell am I supposed to do for the next 50 years plus of my life? You know? So I didn't do anything. And I fell into a serious state of depression because my body hurt. I didn't walk good. I weighed about 160 pounds, you know, soaking wet. And I was insecure with myself. I didn't go to the gym because I had like this limp. I hurt real bad. My body was in pain all the time. I sweated just immediately walking, walking a block. I'd pour sweat. So I fell into this depression, got into video games, drank beer, abused narcotics that were given to me, like, like skills from the VA, and just didn't do shit. That's when the growth stopped. That's when my personal growth stopped. Luckily for me, and I'm hoping if you guys, there's some of you guys that are going through that here, luckily for you that you can hear my story. Because I actually got what I like to call the reckoning of my life. And that was a day at Disneyland with my daughter. If you guys follow me on Instagram, you know me and my, my daughter's life. And there's a reason for it. My daughter at two years old saved my life. I'm gonna try to repay her for the rest of my life that I can, because she doesn't even know. But I went to Disneyland. I couldn't even do anything on my daughter's birthday at Disneyland. I couldn't walk, couldn't enjoy anything, because I was one, out of shape. 
I didn't take care of myself. I was insecure with myself where it was hot as shit in Disneyland. I wore jeans, you know, and stuff like that because I just didn't want, I, didn't, I just, you walk around at kids and everybody just staring at you like, you know, and it caused a lot of issues with me there where basically we had to leave Disneyland. I'm driving home so emotionally upset with myself and so mad at myself that I, at one point I was a staff sergeant leading soldiers kicking fucking ass fearless son of a bitch, you know, and here I am crying in a car because I allowed myself not to grow from everything that I went. I stopped and I allowed myself to fall into this hole. And that was my reckoning. That night we got home after two hours, longest two hours of my life. I'll never forget. I almost get emotional thinking about it. It was just a little baby back there asleep, you know, and I ruined this shit, you know, immediately get home and I got rid of everything, all the narcotics all the Doritos, and I know that sounds stupid, but that was all just the bullshit, you know? And I went through three days of withdrawals, ferocious withdrawals, bedridden, sick as a dog, couldn't move, hating everything and everybody. But that's what I needed to do, you know? There was all these reasons why I needed to do it, and I needed to fucking buckle down and do it, and I did. Next day, or after three days, I went down to a nutrition store. I walk into a nutrition store, and I don't know sh really shit about, like at the time, supplements that was going on. There was so much stuff out there by the time I started going to, back to the gym. And I just got my basic stuff. And I remember just telling myself, I swear every single day I'm gonna go to the gym, and I'm just gonna work out. And this was not power, this was just, just go to be healthy. So I started going. And when I got in there, same thing, sweatpants. Very insecure, didn't want people knowing that I was an amputee. You know, why? I don't know. I just wasn't proud of that yet. Yeah, and I just wasn't comfortable with that yet. And as I started working out, I started noticing a lot of things started changing my life. A lot of positive things just started happening. And I started just working out harder. I started noticing that I started walking better. You know, I'm carrying around at first, you know, 20 pound dumbbells and you know, I've got a little limp going. Next thing you know, six, seven months later, I'm 100 pound dumbbells, just like a fucking beast to a bench to sit down and nobody knows shorts. And I'm just, and guys looking at me like, that motherfucker missing a leg outlifts my ass, you know? So now I realize like, oh shit, I can actually motivate people with like my disabilities. So one day I, just like you guys, was like, I'm gonna go to my very first expo just to check it out. And when I used to like, <laughs> when I used to get ready to go to the gym, no joke, this is funny stuff. I used to lay down on the couch, YouTube, C.T. Fletcher, Mark Bell, Dana Bailey, you know, back when she was a beast. And I, I'd sit there and I'd get hyped on watching these people's videos. I'm great friends with C.T. Fletcher, great friends with Dana Bailey, great friends with Mark. These are all people just like you guys, we all like kind of look up to and idolize and different things. And never did I think that I would be in the same business atmosphere as like head to head with these guys. You know what I mean? Like socializing with these people that I just used to sit there and watch on my TV before I go to the gym and get motivated, you know? And so I remember sitting there, well, I waited in line for Jay Cutler for like an hour and a half. I waited for Mark for a long time. That was the first time we met. Met CT, met Rich Piana. You know, these are like guys that, you know, we all like get excited to see. And I, and I was like, this is what I want to do. Like, I want to be like in this atmosphere. There's nothing, there's nobody like me. Like, there's no soldiers. Like, where, where's, where's the soldiers at? You know, there's, there's fucking combat wounded vets that could be like kicking ass. And then I went to a powerlifting meet. And I've never powerlifted, never done anything in my life ever like that. It wasn't in my realm. I was like a bro guy, you know, get arms pumped, chest pumped, forgot to the clubs or whatever like that. That's what I did. Push-ups, you know, uh, squats were not in my thing. It just not happening. So I went to a powerlifting meet and this big, ugly bastard comes out from the back. His name's Brandon Allen, by the way, <laughs> ugliest guy ever. So he comes out from the back and all, I, all there is, there's, there's, just, there's so much hype. And there's so much going on, so much adrenaline. And I'm watching like this dude just lift this crazy amount of weight. And the feeling that I got, I was like, oh shit, this is what I want to do. Like, this is what I want to do. And so I immediately left, got on the internet, started looking like MPG power. It's like, who's the strongest ones out here? Like who, and there were none like that were competing in like just able body power thing like there's the, the 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 paralympics and stuff like that like got it you know it does not i did the handicap thing doesn't work for me <laughs> it hasn't worked for me and so 
I was like, this, oh, there's got to be a reason why. Well, I'll tell you why. It's fucking hard. That's why. As an amputee, it is fucking hard to squat and deadlift and just walk around, let alone. And I'm not just an amputee. Like, I have severe, I have blown out knee, blown out ankle. My whole back was fractured. My arm was torn apart pretty well. So I had a lot of injuries that were all kind of going against me into this powerlifting thing. And so I immediately get on, you know, the internet and I try to find out, like, where's the local powerlifting gym to me? And I find one, I get down there, I go there, I walk in and the owner's there and I introduce myself and I just say, I want a power lift. And he immediately is like looking at me and he looks at my leg and he looks at me. I said, I know. <laughs> it's good. I was like, I know it's going to be, he's like, oh, you just want to do bench, like bench only? I was like, no, I want to compete against able-bodied athletes. And he just kept looking at me. I said, I know. I said, but when it happens, it's going to be epic as fuck. You know, and I said, and I promise you, if you, if you're about to tr believe in anybody, believe in me, because this is what I want. There's nothing more that I want than this. And it, I just felt like it was just like you said, it's just, it was my calling. Like I just felt it, you know, and I, and not just that, I, I needed it. Like I needed it, you know? And so I just, I started training and it was brutal. Like I, a few deadlifts in back was cramping. I'm on the leg press machine, trying to stretch my back out, go back to deadlifts and try to get a couple more reps in, lay back on the leg machine, you know, to decompress my back a little bit. It was brutal. And I, and every single day, every single day, it was hard for me to get my ass up to want to go do it some more. But I did. And I did it. And I felt like it was, it was everything that I had been through. This wasn't shit compared to that. And that's where I feel like that growth came from. I grew from all the shit that happened to me, all this pain and stuff. I could handle it. And my mind was right. My body was getting better. And I wanted to see how far I could push the limits, no matter what the fucking doctor said. Casey, you're going to be in a wheelchair sooner. You're going to, you know, you blow out your knee. You're going to have, have to have a knee replacement. You're going to have to do this. Well, guess what? I think next, March, April, May, next May, I have to have a knee replacement. It's okay. It's okay. I'm okay with that. Guess what? I'll be right back in this motherfucker when they tell me no. Okay? It's just the way it is. And at the time, I didn't believe it. I was like, it'll just happen when it happens. But I, it didn't matter. There was nothing that was going to detour me from, like, wanting something so bad. So I train. And when Mark says that some people are just built for this and some people are not, and this is just some shit you got to want, I wanted it. And when I sit here and tell you <laughs> some of these... I trained to learn how to squat, to learn how to squat to depth for a whole year before I ever competed full power. One movement took me a whole year to learn to just be able to do a full power comp. And that was that meet with Ed Cohen. And, and in the back, everybody stressed out, you know, because my squat, when I squat with anything below 400, it's not hitting depth because I have no meniscus, I'm bone on bone in my right knee, and the legs and the muscles just, they need to be forced down. So the more weight I put on, the deeper I can get. I can't go squat a bar for you guys. It's not gonna happen, it has to be 400 pounds plus. And that's what pushes me down. And, and Ed knew this, but nobody knew this, and everybody was stressed out. So I go out there, first meet, I'm lined up, and I just go fast as I can. I was like, I'm gonna blow through like this pot that's gonna like get me stuck. And then I'm going to pop right back and be good. No, red light. And I went, walked over to the thing, and there was T-Pool and all those guys over there. And they're like, oh, dude, they should have fucking gave you that. Bop, bop. Fuck, no, they should. That shit was high as shit. I saw the video. I want to be treated like y'all. I want to beat your guys' asses legitimately, you know? So then I go out. We reset. I get out there on my second lift, and I hit depth. And everything was great. And Ed Cohen's like, let's call it. Like, you're good. You're in it now. And I was like, what the fuck? I was like, I'm doing this whole meet, man. We're doing this thing, you know? And went out there and did my third lift heavier than my second lift, just like everybody else. Going into that meet, I had attempted a 600-pound deadlift four or five times. Uh, I attempted one time on my live day, another time on my birthday. And I just kept missing it. And I told everybody that I was going to pull a 600 pound deadlift at that comp. Like it was going to happen. And we were in the back and I did my first deadlift and I come back, sit down. I go, how was that Ed? And <laughs> Ed's a smart ass. And he was just like, yeah, if you pull like that, so you pull that slow again, you're definitely not going for 600 at night. 
today. And I was like, fuck, was that slow shit? So I get out there and he's just like, you need to tear the second one up or you're not getting that 600 pound deadlift call. I'm not putting that number up for you. So I went out there and just, boom, hit it as hard as I could, lifted it, felt good. Kel Murray had just shaking his head at me and I was like, fuck, I'm not getting 600 pound deadlift today. So then my third lift comes up and Ed doesn't even tell me what it is. He's just like, go out there and lift. And I was like, son of a bitch, it's not 600. So I walk up and I glance, oh, it's 600. I look at the screen, it's 600, yeah. So I'm sitting there and then I come over and as I'm getting over there, I get uh, a girl named Gracie V and then I get Ed and they pull me over to the side before I get ready to lift. And this is when powerlifting changed for me. It was in this last little moment of my very first meet ever. Gracie and Ed were in my ear. You can hear it on like the YouTube video. They're in my ear, really Gracie's in my ear. And she told me, that this isn't even about you anymore. This was no longer about me. It was about the hundreds of people's lives that I can change, about the hundreds of people's lives that I can help motivate. And that right there is when I realized like po what powerlifting truly meant to me. It was no longer about like what my next lifts are gonna be, how heavy they're gonna be. It was about me pushing myself and putting myself through pain and pushing the limits to motivate people. And there was like nothing in, that, in that, that day that was gonna stop me from pulling that 600 pound. And if you watch the video, it was a grinder. It really was, it was vicious, you know? And I just remember I, just, I didn't wanna let go of the bar once I did it, you know? I did not wanna let go of the bar. I also didn't wanna pull an Eddie Hall and drop the bar, pumped, you know? But I remember just walking off there and the emotions that I had were so hard. Uh, like you said, Ed Cohen was just emotional and seeing like a dude like Ed Cohen emotional, it's hard to really hold it together, but you know, that's when it changed for me. That's when my whole life changed. And this is when I realized, like, this is what I wanted to do with my whole life. And when I tell you guys, like, it's hard for me to do this every day, uh, my girlfriend can tell you. <laughs> She's around. In the mornings, you guys, I, no joke, when I get up and going in the mornings, I have to, you know, get up, put my leg on. And I, when I start to walk, I'm pinned, like, holding walls to get myself kind of going and getting in motion every day. I have to take ice baths, hot showers. I have to see a chiropractor two to three times a week, a physical therapist two to three times a week. Like it's, it's literally has turned into something that is a lifestyle to me. And, <laughs> and I am not getting rich off doing this, you know, but it, I'm getting rich off of watching everybody be so pumped and motivated just to watch me lift some weights. You guys are pumped and motivated to see me lift weights, something that literally has like helped save my life, you know? And it's like Mark said, it, the, 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 this is, everything has changed compared to what it used to be back then, you know? And powerlifting is getting so big now. And the one thing I can tell you about powerlifting, here's what's great about it, is one, it's already like a family, you know? Even when the head-to-head -head guys, like the biggest, baddest dudes are like competing and they're $40,000, those two people are out there getting each other fired up to get that next lift, that that's gonna be a massive lift for them. Not just that, powerlifting is something that every single person, literally, okay, if I can do it, you can do it, can get strong as fuck at, if you're willing to put in the work. If you're willing to do those extra reps, those extra sets, you know? Every day I have to go in and do some squats. I used to hate them, I used to hate them. Never look for, it's one of my favorite days to go in and lift because it is the hardest fucking thing for me to do, you know? And if I can sit here and defeat something that's so damn hard, it's gonna make me that much stronger and a better person, physically, mostly mentally. And this sport and like what we do, it's really a, really a mental thing. And if you guys can get that all up in here in your brains and understand that the mind could do some great things, because let me tell you, I swear, I've laid there many times thinking that this is it for me, I'm not doing this no more. Like I just can't, it hurts, it's painful. You know, busting my uh, prosthetic, like my, my limb, slicing wide open because of the amount of pressure from squats when I squat, just slicing wide open and blood going everywhere, you know? But bandaging it up and just going and fucking squatting some more, you know? Sweating profusely, I'm sweating right now, damn. <laughs> you know, it's just, it's painful, but enjoy the pain. It means you're fucking breathing, you're fucking living, and you can still kick some fucking ass. So thank you guys for coming, Mark. This is awesome. First little event you've a, ever done. I got a few questions for you. Mm -hmm. um, 
you know, you kind of mentioned you, you, came, you came back from, the, uh, from, from losing your leg, getting amputated. You were in, in the hospital for three years. I mean, that must have been uh, just absolutely brutal. You mentioned losing weight and depression and being on pills and different things. What, what like, what's the thing... You mentioned your daughter at Disney, Disneyland and stuff like that. What, what was the thing, though, that, that allowed you to push over the hump to, to, to not only just train, but to train enough to where you were like, this, like, this is good medication for me. Like, just going in the gym is, is what I need to be doing. You know, it was... It was it's, hard, it, it's hard to get started, and it's, it's hard to continue when right. it hurts. You it, know? It, it just became something that was, like, really emotional for me. You know, it was just, like, setting these small little goals... You know, and, 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 and not wanting to fail at those goals, you know, like I was a leader in the military, you know, and I don't know, like, there's a lot of different ranks and stuff here, but I had, you know, we're all leaders, you know, no matter what, like out here, you know, to civilian life, we're like leaders, you know, if you think about it. And that was the thing. It was, it was that it was lifting for those that can't lift anymore that aren't here with me. You know, like I, like my, my, one of my team leaders, he got, we weren't there very long and he got blown to pieces and, and he loved lifting. It was something that he just loved. And it was, it's just about finding something and giving yourself reasoning. You know, you've got to have a reasoning. You've got to have a goal. You know, if you're just, if you don't have a goal when you go to the gym, you're literally just there going through the fucking motions. What's, uh, what's the mental dialogue you have now when you're, when you're in pain and you're <sighs> sketching on the wall and everything like that? Uh, you know, I just feel like I've been now, I've been doing this for so long that I understand like it's pain and it's, it's as I get going through the day and as I get like, do like my routine that I've come up with, it, it, it goes away. Mm. Uh, uh, it's just like I said. Though, so it's, it's a habit now. It's a habit yeah, now. Yeah, and, yeah. That, and that's what you want to create with yourself is a habit, you know, and, and like, you know, writing down in a book, maybe like, you know, and, and by November, I want to deadlift this mm. or by this, you know, because my first deadlift was 315. It was 315 pounds, the first deadlift I ever did. And then I tried 355 and it slipped out of my hand and I didn't, you know, it, it, and now, you know, then I hit, remember the first time I hit 500, you know, and, and I was like, oh, that's it. I'm done. This is perfect. <laughs> I was stoked, you know, and then, here we are over, you know, I'm deadlifting over six and I eventually want 700, you know, and that's just, the, that's just the goals, you know, and, and I feel like if you guys don't set goals daily with just yourself, you know, who's that, there was that Navy SEAL commander just said like, just start out making your fucking bed, you know, something like that, do that, like set small goals, these small goals turn into big goals. You What's know. your uh, live day about? You mentioned it briefly as you were talking through a live day, live day. So, What's you know, a live days, there's like the day that it's like, it's a basically like an alive, it's, it's a day that I should have been dead and I'm alive still to breathe and, 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 and keep living. And, and uh, some of you guys are religious, you know, you can sit there and say, well, God's protecting that day. Me and my, my boys are protecting me that day. They were working their ass to save my life. And I think that's relatable to a lot of people, drug addictions and, and various things that turning points in their life. Yeah, I mean, and, and it's a thing is like, you know, some of you guys are in the military and you guys may not experience, uh, uh, it could be Air Force, it could be whatever you guys do. You guys may not be overdoing, kicking in doors, you know, blasting people down and shit like that. You may never have to experience that, but there's going to be something in your life. And trust me, when, and I know this because, because of like what I've been through and how I push myself mentally, I get a lot of people, civilians, all over the world that will come at me with different things of depression or anxiety or something. Like one just recently, his dad, him and his dad were like very, very close. You know, like very close. And his dad just died, you know, no, out of nowhere. And he ended up putting on a shit ton of weight. And I posted this in my thing and I'm working with the kid now and his name's Charlie or Billy. And, and he, his wife messages me, tells me he's in the heart hospital the second time. And the doctors are worried about the next time he comes, he's not going to be alive. And she told me like he was so close to his dad and his dad died. And he just gained all this depression mm -hmm. and over 400 pounds, 25 year old kid, you know? And I was like, fuck, you know, what can I do? So I just got in my car and I drove to the hospital. I don't know him. I don't know him. His wife's just like, I don't know what to do. I was like, I'm going to fucking come down there because I can sit there on the phone and tell you some cool shit, I guess. But me showing up there, I, I want you to, I, want, I believe in you to change your life. And, and, and so I went down there and this kid is in the gym every day for the last two weeks. You know, I remember showing up at his house. We got, I got out of the hospital at like 1130 at night. I showed up at his house 5 a.m. and we went for a walk. And I talked to him about you with your little, you know, your 20 minute walks and just starting mm -hmm. off small like that, man. It's just like, do so. Now he's in the gym and he's in there getting after it and trying to change his life. You know, so, um, you know, you, it may not be some combat related shit. It may be something personal that just happens. You're driving a car, 
massive accident happens, passenger dies, it used to be your brother, you know, something like that. You're going to deal with some traumatic shit. Everybody's going to deal with some traumatic shit throughout their life. It's just the way it is. That's life. And, you know, that's why I feel like I can just try to help people mentally because we're all going to deal with some shit like that. How, how'd you deal with being uh, frustrated? Uh, you, you must have been extremely frustrated. Not, I mean, obviously you're frustrated with your condition and, and the uh, prosthetic and everything hurts, all that. But I mean, how'd you deal with maybe possibly even just being frustrated at other people? They don't understand your condition. No one understands. Like, did you ever kind of get in that, fall into that mode? Yeah, I do. I was telling you about it earlier. You know, I deal with like when I deadlift, I do not deadlift like textbook deadlifting. I don't mm. squat textbook. The only thing I do textbook, you know, wise is bench press. And I get it a lot on my Instagram. Like when I deadlift, you know, you get all these dudes. <laughs> Why are you doing a stiff leg deadlift? Oh my, yeah, like why, why are you doing, why are you not, you know, bearing down the bar? Why are you not, you know, why are you doing stiff leg deadlifts? Oh my God, your, your back's going to break, you know? And I'm like, bitch. <laughs> First off, get off private profile, you know, and, and let's see you lift, you know? I mean, it's just, I deal with it, you know, but it, it's, it, 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 it's it, at first it used to bother me. Now it's just like, I, I, I know what I'm kind of doing. This is the way I do it. And when I've had like you, Ed Cohen, you know, these very well-known high professional powerlifters telling me, well, that's just the way your biomechanics work. That's the way your body works. There is no really like textbook way anymore. You know, what there is, is a way of like not being injured, like right. doing stupid shit, you know, but, and getting the basics down. But I mean, look at everybody's deadlift. I mean, like Belkin. Okay, if Belkin's textbook then, then why the hell is not everybody deadlifting just like Belkin. And Ed Cohen will tell you, nobody will ever deadlift like Belkin in probably another decade plus years. You know, everybody tries to mimic his deadlift, but you, that's his body, that's his biomechanics, that's the way he does it. Doesn't mean the way you're doing is incorrect. It's just, that's your way. Well, this is my way. And this is the way that I have been building myself because I never powerlifted before. So this is the way my body knows how to work. And so that's what I just come to realize. I'm like, y'all just don't know me then. You know, and, and, and when I go and do like seminars, I always like to bring somebody up to show them that, that, the, 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 the right way, I guess you could say, instead of my way. Because if you guys see me deadlifting, you know, it is a lot of lower back and stiff leg. And you guys' deadlifts are going to go probably down the shitter because you're not, <laughs> de you don't deadlift like I deadlift. You know, your body's not built like mine. So that, I just literally just now just allowed to let it go and just run out. You know, but I can tell you this, like one of my, things that I do like pre-gym is, and it, it's, it's crazy, but it works for me to get motivated. It's, this is my way. Now this isn't gonna be for all y'all. You all have to find your own little way, but this is no joke. I tell a lot of people like, how do you get motivated to go to the gym every day? And I said, well, a lot of times I drive to the gym, I just sit in the parking lot for a few minutes and you know, get myself pumped up. But a lot of times what I do is I, I, I read like comments and stuff, or I read messages and I respond back to people. And I live this lifestyle of like no excuses. And here I am about to make a fucking excuse, you know, and this mm. is, that's not even who I am, you know, but we have those days and we just got to find ways to motivate ourselves. And that's my way of like motivating myself. And then, you know, anytime I get ready to lift, I always just run through some emotional stuff that is inside me before I get ready to lift, you know, whether, you know, my daughter, my buddies that I, are no longer here, different situations in my life to just fuel me before I lift. And a lot of that frustration is being taken out inside here, you know, and, and, and even there's days that, you know, I don't do two a day workouts a lot, you know, I, but there's times that I need those two a day workouts, you know, the frustration is taken out in, in here and, and uh, this whole scene and people and this family has, uh, has made me a better person today than what I was before. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you guys.